three very long, thin-walled hollow cylinders of 50, 100, and 150 mils in diameter are arranged coaxially, right? So they have their own one, the, the bigger one is on, sorry, the small one is inside the bigger one and in, so on. The temperatures of the surfaces of the 50 and the 150 meter diameter cylinders are maintained at 1200 Kelvin and 400 Kelvin. So the one with the smallest radius has the biggest temperature and the one with the smallest radius, uh, sorry, the biggest radius has the smallest temperature. The emissivity of all of them is 5%. Assuming a vacuum between the annular spaces, find the steady state temperature attained by the surface at 100 mils. So we want to know what is the temperature of this fella here, right? So let's actually put, give some names. So TB here, that's what we're looking for. This is A, this is C, all right? And this is a, just a picture that I got out of Google so that you guys can, so we can relate the problem in the other dimension as well. Um, what, are, what is important here? Well, a couple of things are important. Very long is important, vacuum is important, and thin walled is important, okay? It being thin walled means that the conduction is very small or negligible, right? In our case here, we're gonna ignore it, but a thin walled uh, cylinder, we know that the res thermal resistance due to conduction is dependent on the thickness of the cylinder. So a thin walled one is one that we're pro pretty much will have little to no conductive resistance. Also, it being in a vacuum means there's no air or any fluid between the, the cylinders that can assist in the heat transfer, right? So we can't have convection because we're not gonna have the molecules going upwards due to uh, difference in buoyancy forces or molecules being pushed from an external force. So pretty much what those two guys are telling us is conduction can be ignored, convection can be ignored. The only thing taking place here is radiation. The next thing that is important is that it's very long. It being very long means two things. First, that this area over here is negligible in comparison to this area over here. Right, and mathematically speaking, the pi r squared is negligible or is very small in comparison to the two pi r l. The other thing is that we can use the infinity properties of these surfaces, because check it out. When two infinite parallel planes are considered, a, a area one and area two are equal, and the radiation shape factor is unity since all the radiation leaves one plane which is the other. So that's the situation when we have two infinite par parallel planes. The point here being that all the radiation leaving one plane reaches the other. Okay, so in spite of this being like a hypothetical case and a theoretical case, we can actually apply this to real case situations in which the, the, the cylinder is very long, like our case here, right? And that's kind of one of the beauties of engineering, in my opinion. Because engineering, we take these principles that are only theoretical and we apply them to real life and they work, okay? So if we had two parallel plates and all the energy was going from one to the other, then we could use this one. If we have cylinders, which is our case, then we can use this bottom one here, okay? So our condition is that all the energy leaving A, uh, blue, I guess, energy leaving A goes to B and it does. And all the energy leaving B goes to C and it does, right? So you know our Q is going from the inside to the outside. So all the energy leaving this guy here goes to this guy here. There's no other place for it to go. And all the energy leaving this guy here goes to the other guy there, right? So what is this equation telling us? Well, it's telling us that the energy equals Stefan Boltzmann constant, the area of the one who has the greatest energy, the temperature of the one with the greatest energy minus the temperature of the one with the smallest energy, divided by one over the emissivity of the one with the greatest energy over the ratio of the area between the greatest energy and the smallest energy and the emissivity of the one with the smallest energy. As a matter of fact, note that this term here is really the emissivity minus one, right? So it's like everything else, emissivity minus everything else. All right, cool. So we're gonna be applying this, uh, these equations to our problem and I actually copied the equation over here. 
And the idea here is that we're going to look at this problem and we're going to try to come up with the solution because we only have to use energy balance to be able to come up with the solution here. We can just look at it and apply it straight off. Um, just note something here. Just invert this. There you go. Okay. So what are we looking for? We're looking for the temperature TB, right? And we want to find the temperature TB at steady state. Okay, so what I want you guys to do is I want you guys to know that on this equation here, we would have two unknowns, right? If we're going from A to B, we don't know this, and we also don't know the temperature B. If we're going from B to C, we don't know this, and we also don't know temperature B. So we have two unknowns to use this equation by itself. What I want you guys to do now is I want you guys to close your eyes and I want you guys to picture the cylinder B. Okay, think about the cylinder B just floating somewhere, like out in space by itself on a vacuum. This is B. Okay, and I want you guys to close your eyes and picture the energy that's going into B and the energy that's flowing away from B. Q in and Q out. Right? And we're gonna do take this as our control volume and we're gonna do a little energy balance in this guy. Okay, because we want the temperature B at equilibrium, right? Because we want temperature B at equilibrium, then, or because after equilibrium is reached, that means that if we're at equilibrium in steady states, steady states, equilibrium, then Q in has to be equal to Q out. Let's explore that a bit more. Okay, please keep picturing that, that cylinder just floating in the air, okay? And we can open your eyes if you had your eyes closed and then come back to this and let's look at this situation here. Let's pretend for a moment that the temperature for B is 900 Kelvin, okay? I'm just guessing a temperature. If it's receiving more energy from A than it's giving away to C, then over time, this temperature will increase. Maybe now it's 950 and maybe now it's 1000. And then maybe now it stopped changing. If it stops changing, it means we arrived at steady state, right? We have equilibrium because all the energy that is going into B will be going into C. So its temperature won't change anymore. Another possibility would be, let's say that this actually is a smaller temperature, maybe 600. And now it is, um, I think I flipped it, right? 600, now it's receiving more energy from A than it's giving out to C. So we would expect this temperature to increase over time. Maybe now it's at 800. Maybe now it goes to 900 and then it stops. And when it stops, it means that all the energy that it's receiving from A equals the energy it's, it's giving away to C, right? And the other possibility, if it's decreased, it's, it's giving more energy to C. Point is that when steady state is achieved, that means that the temperature is not gonna be changing anymore. And then we have the situation here. If the situation here occurs, then that means that Q that goes from A to B, because we know energy is going from A to B, has to be equal to Q that's going from B to C, right? And what we can do is we can relate these two guys. And if we do so, we're gonna have one unknown. That unknown will be temperature of B. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna get this equation here. I'm gonna copy it. I'm gonna paste it twice, and I'm gonna make them equal, okay? And on this side here, I have A to B, so let's put down the, uh, the, actual, the actual things for A and B. So area of A, temperature of A, temperature of B, emissivity of A, area of A, area of B, emissivity of B. And over here, it's from B to C, so area of B, temperature of B, Temperature C, emissivity B, area of B, C, emissivity of C. Okay, so know that now we have all the data that we need except for TB, which is exactly what we're looking for. So to solve this, I'm going to eliminate this guy first, and I'm going to send this fellow here dividing, divided both sides by area of B. So I'll have something that's going to look like this area of A divided by area of B multiplies temperature of A to the fourth minus temperature of B to the fourth divided by 
1 over this of e of a plus a b. 1 over missivity of b minus 1. And this has to be equal to, this side is a bit more simple. Cool. Now, next thing, I want you guys to note that the area of A divided by area of B for a cylinder, right, very long cylinder, is 2 pi R A times L divided by 2 pi R B times L. Having the same length and pi and 2 being constants, this is the same thing as radius of A over radius of B, which in turn is the same thing as diameter of A, diameter of B. Okay, in this case here, diameter of A is 50 mils and diameter of B is 100 mils. So this is just 0 0.5. Likewise, um, area of B over area of C, that would just be the diameter of B over the diameter of C. And in this case here, we have 100 divided by 150. Okay? So those values are something that we already have without really having to calculate the area per se. So we can do, one more step here, we can plug in the numbers. So let's go ahead and plug in the numbers for this problem. Move this a bit to the center. So we have um, 0.5, I'll just leave it as 50 over 100. 1200. One over 0 0.05 plus 50 over 100. So five minus one. And this has to be equal to pi unknown minus 400 to the fourth divided by over 5 plus 100 over 150 1 over emissivity minus 1. Okay, to so solve this, I'm not going to do every single step, but what you do is you do this sum, you do this sum, and then you send this guy multiplying over there, and then you're going to combine we're going to combine this term, this term, and this term. All right, and what I got when I did that was 0 0.55 multiplying 12 to the fourth minus TB to the fourth equals TB to the fourth minus 400 to the fourth. And then you solve for TB. And you get 932.9 Kelvin. So that will be temperature of B when we reach steady state. Okay, that is, that will be the temperature of B that does not change with time anymore, right? Once we have that, then solving the second part of the problem is very straightforward because the second part of the problem is. Calculate the radiation heat transfer between the inner and the outermost cylinders. So what is it asking? It's asking us for to calculate the Q from A to C, right? From the innermost, which is A, to the outermost, which is C. But we note that the energy that leaves A and goes to B is the same as the energy that leaves B and goes to C at steady state, right? Therefore, the energy that's going from a to B is the same energy that's going from B to C. Therefore, the energy that goes from A to C is the same one as well. So we can happily put an equal sign here and we can calculate QAB or QBC. Either way, that will be correct. You can choose. I chose to do K, Q, uh, QAB. 
So once again, let me go ahead and copy this, or actually I'm gonna copy the whole thing. Copy that, and now we can do that. Part B, I'm looking for QAB, which in turn is the same thing as QBC. So this guy becomes area of A, A, B, A, A, B, B. So 5.699 times 10 to the minus eight. Area of A, pi, diameter of A, 50 times 10 to the minus three meters times L, L being the length of the cylinder because it's a long cylinder, multiplied by difference in temperatures to the fourth, 932.9 Kelvin. And I'm dividing the whole thing by one over 0 0.05 plus ratio between the areas, 0.5. I've got this to be 397. The only thing we need to know before we actually finish this off is that we have Stefan Boltzmann. Then we have the um, radius and we have oops to the fourth. And we have Kelvin to the fourth over here. And on the bottom, we don't have any units, right? Because emissivity doesn't have any units, so that's all good. And these two guys, they have the same unit, mils over mils, so there's the units go away, it becomes a dimensionless, just a ratio between the areas. So what happens to our units, Kelvin? to the fourth, all good. And then meters eliminates the meter squared. And we'll have watts per meter, which makes sense because we don't have a value for the length. So we're just gonna be finding Q as watts per meter length. So Q from A to B, which is equal to Q from A to C equals 397 watts per meter. All right, any questions?